Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours, the stream where you usually post questions and I answer those questions about uh, the Microsoft database uh, platform. Um, as it happens today, I'm not taking live questions. I'm actually going through uh, about a dozen questions that I already answered, uh, but the recording didn't work. <laughs> I went to Palm Springs, went to the desert. Oh, that's the wrong uh, display. Let me switch that real quick so you can see in the chat. There we go. Uh, I went through uh, Palm Springs and took like a dozen of them while I was sitting at the Trixie Motel pool. Um, oh, I got to hit record on the camera too as well. Forgot about that. Uh, took about a dozen questions at the Trixie Motel pool, uh, only to find out that I'd forgotten to turn on my microphone later. Moron! Sadtrombone.com. So let's go through these questions. Oh, I should say, too, thank you to, to the Kazakh for subscribing, and uh, good morning to Randy and Tim that we've got over there in chat. Um, so the first question is from Need Money. What's the fastest and easiest way to make money as a SQL Server consultant? And he follows up with several different kinds of work, performance tuning, health tuning, whatever. Okay, so here's the fastest way to make money. Talk to the people who already know and trust you. Talk to the people who are in your network and ask them, what do you need help with? After all, they already trust your work. Odds are they'll vouch for you and they can talk to the people that they work with. Uh, and I'm talking about your past coworkers, past managers, and so forth. They've gone on to other companies and they're able to sing your praises without you being there. That gets you in the door much faster. Plus, they're more likely to come right out and tell you, oh, thank you, Randy. Uh, Randy, for uh, subscribing. Welcome to the club. Uh, uh, they're more likely to tell you with honesty, here's exactly what we need and here's when we need it. If you look at your, your contacts list and you go, I can't think of anybody that I want to work with, I can't think of anybody that would want to work with me, or there's nobody in here that I want to call, then consulting is going to be a really hard time for you. Uh, a couple of other folks have joined in on the stream. Uh, looks like Ashish, Spitfire is back, D. Sanchez says, good, glad to be back on your streaming. Yes. Um, I'm live in the office now. Uh, I'm actually, in three days, we're going to Hawaii for like a week. Uh, I'll record a couple of office hours over there. We're going to the Aulani Resort, the Disney one, and uh, looking forward to that. Um, Morse, good morning as well. Next up, we have Latest and Greatest who says, when would you recommend upgrading to a new SQL Server? Would you suggest when a relative or relevant feature is released or just when an installed version goes end of life? Okay, so changing SQL Server versions is a lot of work. You have to go build it out. You have to provision that VM, set up the hardware, wherever it is that you're going to host it. You have to install it. You have to configure it. You have to restore the databases onto there. You have to test your application. You got to get your user sign off and your vendor sign off that everything's working okay on the new servers. Then you got to plan your transition across, whether you're using database mirroring, log shipping, always on availability groups, whatever. All of this is a ton of work. And the question becomes, is it the most important thing for you to work on right now? You hear over and over, oh, Mr. TCS, uh, thanks for joining the club. You hear me say over and over again on these streams, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? And that's really evident uh, when you go to do upgrades. Like, why are we doing this? Why am I putting in so much work? Especially if the, the problems that you're having, if it's like performance tuning issues or backup issues, odds are you can probably fix those on the current version that you're already on. So always start with that. What's the problem that I'm trying to solve? Eventually, your version is going to approach being out of support. And at that point, you're going to have your own problem that you have to solve there. But uh, as, lo if it, as long as the version's under support, focus on what problem your users are having. And that'll really help influence your career. Hi, Joseph. Uh, good to see you. Uh, next up, we have Polar Express, who says, Would you consider or recommend a client to use SQL Server Express Edition as a viable solution for a small web app? 
No, because the, the performance of SQL Server Express Edition caps out at one CPU core and one gig of memory, if I remember right. It might be slightly different. It might be two CPU cores and two gigs of memory, but it's somewhere inside there. Um, and any time that I would encourage somebody to use that, just go use a hosted solution like Azure SQL DB or Amazon RDS. It's going to end up way easier because you don't have to worry about backups, corruption checking, etc. With Express Edition, it's up to you to figure out how you're going to do backups, corruption checking, and so forth. And since Express, uh, Express Edition doesn't have its own built-in scheduler, that means you're going to try to duct tape something together with like Windows Task Scheduler, and you're going to get really frustrated. Plus, you still have to pay the licensing for Windows, so it's not like it's really free. I would totally go with a hosted uh, one CPU, one core equivalent of Azure SQL DB or Amazon RDS or Google Cloud SQL. Uh, it'll end up being cheaper for you in the long run. Next up, uh, someone asked, Constant Care says they ask, how much cloud cost do you pay to run the Postgres database for Constant Care? I actually wrote a blog post about that a couple few years ago. If you put that same search term into Google and you're going to get the result on brentozar.com, it's not that I don't want to answer it. It's that I genuinely don't remember. I don't remember uh, what the monthly bill was. It just isn't top on my radar. Uh, and I break out the costs and talk about what performance tuning looks like on that platform as well. So check that out over on uh, Google. Next up, right arm of the darling one asks, batch mode on row store is a few years old now. Has it served you well? I'll put it to you this way. It's never backfired on me. There's never been, other than high memory grants, which is kind of its own problem, separate from batch mode on row store. Um, there's never been a time where I was like, oh, we got to turn off this batch mode on row store. It's absolutely killing us. That just hasn't been uh, the number one problem that I've ever needed to solve at a client. I don't think I've even had to hint a client's queries not to use batch mode on row store. So it's, it's fine for me. The bigger problem that I run into is that it doesn't show up as often as I would like it to. Like it when it fires up, it, it's nice and fast, uh, but it just doesn't always fire up as, as often as I would like it to. Uh, let's see here. Mr. TCS, subscribe, subscribe with Prime. They've been subscribed for three months. Thank you. For sure. Uh, next up, we have Sad But True, who says, Hey Brent, what's the most efficient way to tell if data in a table has changed since a point in time? I don't care about what changed, just did it change? I'm using change tracking now, but I'm having a cursor running change tracking functions over 700 tables has a high CPU impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget if all you want to know is what rows changed, just add a last updated column, make it a date time two on every one of the tables that you care about and put a trigger on there to update it automatically whenever the rows are inserted or updated. Now you did just say change. You didn't say anything about rows that are deleted. If you do want to track delete, rows, that becomes a little more problematic. But if all you're doing is looking for the change of content, I love triggers for that kind of thing. They're super efficient. Then in whatever ETL app or process that you're using to go pull down what changed, you can just save the time of the last time that your uh, ETL job finished and then just go pass that in as a, per or started rather, started. Um, uh, and then say, give me everything whose uh, date time stamps are higher than the start time of my last ETL job. I say start time because if you have 700 tables, it's going to take you a while for your, your job to run through all 700. And you're probably not going to be ambitious enough to track the dates on a table by table basis. So just give me everything since the last uh, job started. Started. Next up, Craig says, if I have an if statement that only includes one statement, like if this, then do this thing, is there a reason to ever use begin and end? It's common and it just seems to take up space. I do that too. I, I put begin and end. And here's my logic behind that. If someone goes behind me, and or maybe it's even just me sometime from now, and they go add more code, I want it to be crystal clear to them that the where the if statement starts and ends. Because otherwise, it's real hard to recognize things that aren't there. If someone sees if then if this then do this thing, 
it's real easy for someone to just, especially if it's tabbed in, it's real easy for someone to say, oh, I'll just hit enter and I'll add another line here that's tabbed. And this will also get executed if the if runs. So I just like that begin and end as future proofing. Plus, you probably get paid by the line of code, and that gives you two free lines. Woohoo! Who doesn't like two free lines? Uh, next up, my T got cold says, "Do you still predict that Amazon is trying to build Aurora for SQL Server and Oracle?" I don't remember making that prediction. It's like that old joke: "Do you still beat your wife?" You know, there's no right way to answer that question, unless, of course, you do beat your wife and you're proud of it. But otherwise, you're like, I, I, I never beat my wife. You know, the, the question, do you still, assumes that you already admitted that you beat, beat your wife. Um, I don't know that I ever, it's possible I drink a lot from time to time. And it's possible that I had some drunken webcast where I was like, roar for SQL Server's coming. But I, I, I find that real hard to believe because... SQL Server and Oracle are both closed source, so you can't just swap in the storage engine uh, the way that you would with MySQL or Postgres. So I, I don't think that Amazon's ever tried to build that. I don't think that they would be successful, uh, and I don't think it would be well advised. You did, that's pretty dangerous with a closed source database. Uh, next up, Handsome Consultants Aside asks, Hi Brent, can you think of anything that SQL Server is the best in the market for? Oh, totally. He says, Oracle and Postgres seem to have it beat. Oh, absolutely. So let's say that you're using Visual Studio to build applications. You will generally have an easier time. If you're going to use Microsoft Visual Studio, you're going to generally have an easier time using Microsoft's databases. Uh, there are going to be more examples. There's going to be more integration. It's going to be more up to date with current features and so forth. The other thing it's really good at is if you want to deploy a software application at enterprise customers. I'm not talking software as a service, but enterprises often want to run software inside their own four walls. They want to download it, install it locally. If that's something that you're going to target, uh, enterprises love SQL Server because it meets a lot of things that they require, like single sign-on with Active Directory. If you want to learn more about that, go to, there's a website, and I'm going to pull up a browser on my side because I'm never, is it Enterprise Ready? Yeah, EnterpriseReady.io. EnterpriseReady.io is a checklist of a bunch of features that enterprises usually want when they're buying a sealed box package from somebody. Uh, and when you look at that list of features, you'll be like, oh my gosh, now I kind of see why uh, uh, SQL Server is popular because it does all this stuff really well. Then if you go down that same list, I love Postgres, but if you go down that same list with Postgres, you're going to be like, well, Postgres kind of does that. Well, Postgres... You could add an extension, and maybe, yeah, it's just not the same. SQL Server, that stuff works out of the box. Now, Oracle works out of the box as well, but Oracle tends to be what we call expensive. Next up, let's see here. Hecaton asks, how do people build SQL boxes with a terabyte of RAM? Every motherboard I know of only has four slots for RAM. Oh, come on now. Um, that means that you're only looking at home motherboards. You need to look at enterprise or data center motherboards or server motherboards. I'll tell you the easy way to do it. Go to dell.com and go configure yourself a PowerEdge server. Uh, and depending on the PowerEdge model that you choose, you'll see that there's like a dozen or 18 RAM slots uh, available. And they even have really nice guidance to suggest how to configure the RAM, like how many sticks you need in order to be a good fit for your processor. So, but yeah, stop trying to use home motherboards for servers. I do, there's nothing wrong with it if you want to take that approach, but you miss out on a, a lot of features like lots of RAM sockets, uh, like ECC RAM support and so forth. Uh, next up, DBA Cat says, Hi Brent, have you ever done a mashup of your top uh, roasts you do to people from office hours? I, I haven't, and nothing against it. I think it's a hilarious idea. That idea has never even occurred to me. I think it's hilarious. The only reason I wouldn't drop and do it right now is that I don't have timestamps, like videos and timestamps, of where my favorite roasts happened at, which means that I would have to go back and re-watch a bunch of videos. And 
I'm not one of those people who has a hard time hearing myself talk. I could listen to myself talk all day, even on you know videos, recordings, whatever. And my, the sound of my voice doesn't bother me. My goofy look uh, doesn't bother me. I, it does bother me that I'm wearing a tucked in shirt today. The only reason I'm doing this is because I was wearing a sweatshirt earlier. It's really cold in Vegas. And I didn't want to wear the sweatshirt on the webcast because it kind of has a boring front. This is the front of it, but talk about going off topic. Here's the back. This is the first AI generated sweatshirt that I've ever seen. I was in Japan and it wasn't advertised as an AI generated sweatshirt, but the closer that you look, the more you start to realize that some of the stuff on here is AI generated. Um, and I'll, I'll move over a little bit. So you see, I think it's right here. Where's the text? Yeah, so you see the text in red, for example. That is, uh, e is uh, uh, AI generated. There we go. Um, and so same thing with like numbers at the bottom. Uh, I can see why they AI generated this. It was for a pop-up campaign for Tenga. People who know will know. Uh, but I just found it really funny. And so because that's on the back, it doesn't make a good fit for you know, webcasting. I, think, I thought it was hilarious, though. Uh, next up, Junior Wannabe says, Hi, Brent. What are your thoughts on a decent quick check if something changed recently on a SQL server? Sometimes an app just stops working, and it's easy to look at a modified date of stored procs or functions, but where would you look? If I needed to track that, I actually wouldn't try to track everything that changed on a server because there can be things like trace flags, SP configure settings, statistics, all kinds of stuff. Instead of trying to track everything that did change, track what the effects were. And that's where Query Store comes in really handy. If your server all of a sudden slows down out of nowhere, it's probably due to execution plans getting worse. And one of the cool things about Query Store is it'll show you the before and after query plans. And then at that point, it's much easier to understand when you compare those two, oh, this setting changed because you can look at the properties of an execution plan and see all kinds of things from like max degree of parallelism to memory grant targets uh, to trace flags in use and much more. So check out Query Store for that instead of trying to track everything that changed. And then one more, Chris asks, Having followed your blog for some time, I understand that fragmentation is rarely the root cause of a performance problem these days. Good job. He says, but uh, how do I handle vendors that are insistent on defragmenting the indexes? I'm fine with it. If a vendor says, because here's the thing, at the, at the end of the day, you don't want to be standing uh, in between the users and the vendor when the users are complaining about the vendor's app performance. If the vendor says, trust us, this is the thing that will solve our performance issues, and the users are on a support call with you or whatever, then you go, okay, just to make sure, uh, vendor, when you say that rebuilding the indexes is going to fix this problem, we're going to do it right now, and the users are immediately going to notice a difference. They're going to be much happier, right? Okay, all right, we'll go do it. Oh, the users aren't happier. Okay, so we're going to scratch that line off our checklist. I never want to hear that from you again. Go find the root cause. But other, unless you can get into that kind of situation, then if people want to rebuild them, that's fine. It's like people who tell me, trust me, when I type T-SQL with my left hand, it's way faster. Okay, that's fine. If you have a superstition around that, knock yourself out. That's totally okay. just doesn't get you across the finish line. All right, well, there is a nice uh, handful of questions there. I will go put my sweatshirt, my AI-generated sweatshirt back on, and uh, I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. The next one will be over in Hawaii. Oh, Michael J. Swart, good to see you, sir. Uh, so the next one will be over from Hawaii. So see y'all then. Aloha.